and of this act, the entity described in subsection A shall submit to the President and the Congress a report. Sense of Congress. It is the sense of Congress that the entity should, should be modeled on the Iraq study group. Section 8127, not more than $200 million may be expended for military musical units. For what purposes, the gentleman from Texas rise? No, Speaker, I have an amendment at the desk. Clerk will report the amendment. Amendment number 31, printed in the congressional record offered by Mr. Carter of Texas. Strike section 8127, page 122, lines 6 through 9, relating to military musical units. The gentleman from Texas is recognized for five minutes to speak to his amendment. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I rise to address an issue that uh, I think is very important to the patriotic men and women who fight and defend our country. Uh, Representative McCollum, uh, in good, in good v graces, asked that we, we restrict the uh, military band funding by $120 million. And uh, in an attempt to have a savings, but the Congressional Budget Office has informed us that um, this, uh, this reduction, this $120 million reduction, will not save the American taxpayers one red cent, nor will it reduce the overall DOD spending. Uh, the facts about, about our bands are, are that they are an integral part of the patriotism that keeps our soldiers' hearts beating fast. Uh, t for example, over 10,000 funerals were ha were hel are held per year and these bands attend these funerals that if you have, and many of us unfortunately in this body have had to attend military funerals in the past and they know how much that music means to the, to the parents and the loved ones of our lost heroes. Welcome home celebrations. At Fort Hood I've had the, uh, the real great pleasure of, of being at welcome home celebrations which are very dramatic. Uh, the bu buses pull up at night across the parade ground the, the, in the dark, and then the band strikes up uh, military music, and out of the dark comes marching our soldiers into the parade ground, and the tears flow, and parents and, and children of the soldiers and the loved ones of the soldiers, tears come in their eyes, and that music is an integral part of this. The concerts, the ceremonies, uh, the, the funerals, the ho welcome home celebrations are all part of what what makes our military uh, the patriotic body that it is. Uh, the individual bands performed as many as 1,200 musical missions during the 12 to 15 uh, month deployments. Military bands also perform at USO and other places. The number of bands right now in the Army has 100, 32 active duty, 51 National Guard and 17 Reserve, Air Force 24, the Navy 14 and the Marines 14. And speaking of the Marines, Friday before last, I had the, the first time opportunity for me to go to the parade at the Marine barracks here uh, in Washington, D.C. And everyone, every red-blooded American should attend that, and every member of Congress should attend it. And I, it's my first chance to do it. And that is the most patriotic, striking thing you will ever uh, experience. And to, to lose something like that would be a tragedy for this country. The total uh, millet cost for this, uh, for the bands is $320 million, and $282 million of those dollars is personnel costs. Now, something that many don't understand is these band members that, that, that perform in at least two of the services that I'm familiar with, the Army and the Marine Corps, have other duties. Some of them in the Marine Corps are riflemen, just like every Marine is a rifleman. In the Army, most of these people work in security or military police. And if the bands were not performing, they would still be in the military. They would still have personnel costs, housing costs, and other things that would be part of the DOD expenses. So there's no, ex no this, this is no extra that we're doing here. These people are still going to be employed by the, the military, and they're still going to have those costs. So that's why there's no real savings here. But we are saving something that's important to this country, and that is... This is, this is what makes patriotic people join the military. This is what causes young men and women to have their hearts beat fast on behalf of their country. And to lose our military bands would be a tragedy. And, I, and therefore, I, I am asking that we, that we adopt this amendment 
and that we replace these funds for these military bands so that we uh, are able to continue this long tradition that goes back to the beginning of our country, to having bands play to celebrate military events. I yield back. The gentleman from Texas yields back the balance of his time. For what purpose does the gentleman from Florida rise? Uh, Madam Chairman, I move to strike the last word. The gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Madam Chairman, the gentleman's amendment supports the position of the subcommittee, and I support the gentleman's amendment. For I what purpose? Back. The gentleman yields back. For what purpose is the gentleman I rise from in opposition Washington? to the gentleman's amendment, the gentleman and, and I do this very reluctantly. And I'm glad that the sponsor of the amendment has arrived, and we will let her talk about this. Uh, section. 8127 limits spending for military bans to $200 million for fiscal year 2012. Now that's a lot of money. When you think about, uh, and I'm a person who believes in music, believes in our bands. I've been at Fort Lewis out in my part of the country, now Joint Base Lewis McCord, for many ceremonies, and there's no question about it. The music really does add to the uh, to the whole event. But we're in a very tough fiscal uh, period here. Uh, during the full committee markup, uh, this was agreed to by a voice vote. Uh, the amendment parallels similar language included in Section 599C in the House passed uh, a National Defense Authorization Act for fiscal year 2012. So this, the, the, we had an, we've had the Authorization Committee look at this. We've had, the, um, we've had the Appropriations Committee look at it, um, and I think, uh, uh, I think that the, we ought to support the position that came out of the full committee, and uh, I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman from Washington yields back the balance of his time. For what purpose does the gentlelady from Minnesota, a member of the committee, rise? I move to strike the last word. And the gentlelady is recognized for five minutes. Fellow members, this amendment was uh, adopted by voice in, in committee, and this amendment was not one that I lightly came up with. At a time when we are uh, cutting back on, uh, on WIC, which is uh, Supplements for Children, at a time when we're cutting back on, on education and health care expenses, I kind of felt I had a duty as an appropriator to look at opportunities in which we could cut back. On, on spending. And so I've come up with a few ideas, and I know that they haven't at times been the most popular, but one of them was cutting back on the amount of money we spend on military bands. And I enjoy military bands. I've listened to a lot of them since birth. But the Army alone has over 100 bands, employing 4,600 um, professional musicians and support staff, the Air Force, the Navy, and Marines, and the National Guard have dozens of bands with professional musicians who we all take great pride in. Congress needs to conduct oversights on this portion of the budget. It has grown substantially over the years. And I think we need to figure out what is the right note to have with military bands. So that's why this amendment uh, that I offered that was adopted in full committee did cut, but it also continued to provide $200 million for the Pentagon to, tr to continue this fine tradition. As families and communities across this country see critical services being reduced or eliminated, including music in public education uh, schools all across this country, I think it's time that we ask the Pentagon to make a small sacrifice in its musical budget. And so I would ask the committee to support the original language of the bill and to reject the Carter Amendment. With that, I yield back. For what purpose is the gentleman from New York right? I move to strike the last word. And the gentleman's recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'll be brief. First of all, I'm told that the amount uh, in the bill here, $200 million, is essentially the amount that's being spent now, so this is not really a reduction. But secondly, I just want to add one thing to what the gentlelady from Minnesota said. Over the uh, break we just had, I went to a food pantry operated by a church in Coney Island. There was a line out the door of about 70 or 80 people, and they were giving food packets three days out of every month. Three days out of every month and trying to figure out how to scrounge enough money to give food packets four days out of every month. And of course, we're cutting the budget for women, uh, infants, and children. 
We're cutting the budget for food aids. We're cutting the budget for food stamps. We can maintain the military bans and not expand them. We have to keep this in perspective. Yes, I love John Philip Sousa. I love military bans. I love marching bans. But people have to eat. And we are being savage in the budget that we're passing and in the negotiations uh, on, the, uh, on the debt ceiling. We're being savage on, 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 on things for people to eat. This seems the least we can do. I oppose... Yeah, I'll yield. Thank you, thank you, gentlemen, for yielding. And, and, and I, I, I hear what you're saying about these good programs that are being, being cut and reduced. Uh, and if this actually put money in the pockets of those programs, it would be one thing, but the facts are the cuts that we do here do not change any amount of spending that the DOD does. Reclaiming, because these people continue to have military jobs and they continue to get a re paycheck. Re re reclaiming my time, the limitation in the bill will simply make sure it doesn't expand. And the fact is that with all the negotiations going on and the debt ceiling and everything else, there's going to be pressure to cut everything. And this amendment simply uh, uh, says we can expand here, even though we're cutting far more important things. I think the language in the bill is sufficient. The committee did a wise job. I urge opposition to the amendment. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Does any other member wish to speak to the amendment? If not, the question is on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Texas, and those in favor will signify by saying aye. Those opposed will say no. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it, the ayes have it, and the amendment is agreed to. For what purpose does the gentleman from Florida rise? Uh, Madam Chairman, I move that the committee do now rise. Question is on the committee that the on the question that the committee rise. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. And opposed will say no. In favor of the chair, the ayes have it. The ayes have it. The motion is adopted, and the committee rises. Madam Chair. The Committee of the Whole House on the State of the Union, having had under consideration H.R. 2219, directs me to report that it has come to no resolution thereon. The Chair of the Committee of the Whole House on the State of the Union reports that the Committee has had under consideration H.R. 2219 and has come to no resolution thereon. Pursuant to Clause 8 of Rule 20, the Chair will postpone further proceedings today on motions to suspend the rules on which a recorded vote or the yeas and nays are ordered, or on which the vote incurs objection under Clause 6 of Rule 20. Record votes on postponed questions will be taken later.
For what purpose does the general aid For what purpose does a gentlelady from Florida seek recognition? Madam Speaker, I move that the House suspend the rules and pass H. Res. 268. And the clerk will report the title of the resolution. House Resolution 268, resolution reaffirming the United States commitment to a negotiated settlement of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict through direct Israeli-Palestinian negotiations and for other purposes. 
Pursuant to the rule, the gentlelady from Florida, Ms. Ross Layton, and the gentleman from California, Mr. Berman, each will control 20 minutes, and the chair now recognizes the gentlelady from Florida. I thank the speaker, and I ask unanimous consent that all members may have five legislative days in which to revise and extend their remarks and include extraneous material on House Res 268. Without and objection. Now I yield myself such time as I may consume. The gentlelady is recognized. I thank the speaker. Madam Speaker, I rise today in strong support of H.R.E.S. 268, sponsored by our Majority Leader Cantor and Minority Whip Hoyer, and would like to thank them for their leadership in bringing this important resolution to the floor today. We face a perilous juncture in the history of the Middle East. Our adversaries are far from dormant and are focused on an international effort to isolate and demonize Israel. That is why it is all the more important for the United States to stand by our democratic ally at this critical time. So let's get the facts straight, Madam Speaker. As even Secretary Clinton noted, this Israeli government has made unprecedented concessions in pursuit of peace. Israel has always been willing and able to make the tough sacrifices. Israel has proven its commitment to peace. Unfortunately, Israel does not have a partner for peace and security as the Palestinian leadership continues to never miss an opportunity to miss an opportunity. Abu Mazen can utter all the right words to the Obama administration and the Europeans who appear gullible enough to believe him. But the problem is whenever the Palestinian leadership, past and present, has actually been asked to sign a peace agreement with Israel, it has always refused. Abu Mazen also continues to refuse to recognize Israel as a Jewish state, yet demands that Israel recognize a Palestinian state. And the media he controls through the Palestinian Authority publishes a nonstop barrage of anti-Semitic propaganda. The Palestinian Authority has rejected every offer of peace from Israel. The PA has refused to negotiate directly with Israel. The PA has refused to recognize Israel's right to exist as a Jewish state. It has failed to crack down on violent extremism and anti-Israel incitement. Indeed, it has even tolerated and encouraged such behavior. It has also supported boycotts of Israeli goods and the Palestinian Authority Prime Minister, whom some consider to be a moderate, even participated in a mass burning of such goods. Instead of negotiating directly with Israel, the Palestinian Authority is pursuing unilateral recognition of a Palestinian state from various foreign governments with an eye to recognition of such a state by the UN this fall. Palestinian leaders also keep threatening violence to extract concessions. Abu Mazen has not only failed to recognize Israel's right to exist as a Jewish state, but recently signed a coalition agreement with Hamas, which is committed to Israel's destruction. To demonstrate that they are true partners for peace, what Palestinian leaders must do is simple, Madam Speaker, the opposite of what they've been doing. Sit down and negotiate directly with Israel without preconditions. Encourage Palestinians to accept Israel instead of tolerating and encouraging violent extremism and anti-Israel incitement, and recognize Israel's right to exist as a democratic Jewish state. We must no longer demand that Israel take actions or make additional unilateral concessions that would compromise our democratic allies' safety and security. Recent calls for Israel to return to the 1967 borders are unacceptable and dangerous. Continuing to provide assistance to the Palestinians, assistance amounting to $2.5 billion in the last five years alone, is certainly not the answer. Congress must not agree to the administration's 2012 budget request, which would provide yet another $400 million bailout to the West Bank and Gaza, including another $200 million directly to the PA. There are also many other steps that Congress and the administration can and must take to support our ally Israel and to encourage the advancement of peace and security in the region. The U.S. could show its support for the Jewish state's sovereignty and right to exist 
by moving our embassy to Jerusalem, Israel's eternal and undivided capital. We should demand that the United Nations stop its relentless activities to demonize Israel and the Jewish people and put our money where our mouth is. The most recent example of this bias is a cartoon posted by Richard Falk, which was apparently uh, taken down uh, just uh, minutes ago. Um, and uh, the UN Human Rights Council has appointed uh, Mr. Falk as a, quote, expert, unquote, uh, to investigate and condemn Israel. And uh, I'm sure that the, the viewers could see or they could pull it up on the internet what this cartoon depicts. It depicts Americans and Jews as, as bloodthirsty dogs. Uh, and that is not the first time that Mr. Falk has, uh, has spread such venom. He has compared Israel's treatment of the Palestinians to the Holocaust and questioned the veracity of the 9-11 attacks. But he continues to work for the UN Human Rights Council with over 20% of his expenses and staff paid for by U.S. taxpayers. And has the UN High Commissioner of uh, Human Rights ever condemned Falk and demanded that he resign his UN post? Never. To the, contra to the contrary, her office has published an attack by Falk on his critics. And uh, I understand that he says now that uh, his account was hacked into and he's taken that, uh, that drawing down. But uh, uh, I say enough is enough. The administration should withdraw from the biased Human Rights Council and Congress should withhold funding from the Council and other UN bodies that do not advance our national security interests and conditions U.S. contributions on real reforms. What a concept. And finally, Madam Speaker, instead of dealing directly with the Muslim Brotherhood, which seeks Israel's destruction and condemn the killing of bin Laden, the U.S. should deny all legitimacy to that group, no matter what fake name or label it now uses as it tries to camouflage itself to, into a legitimate political party in Egypt. And I'm glad that this body is doing the right thing today, Madam Speaker. We have much to do, much more to do, to defend our national security interests and our indispensable ally, Israel. I thank the gentleman from Virginia and our distinguished, uh, our distinguished majority leader for authoring this uh, important resolution. With that, Madam Speaker, I reserve the balance of my time. Gentlelady from Florida reserves the balance of her time. The gentleman from California. Well, thank you, uh, Madam Speaker, and I rise in strong support of HRES 268, uh, the Cantor Hoyer resolution, and I yield myself four minutes. Gentleman's recognized for four minutes. Madam Speaker, I believe negotiations are the only path to a two-state solution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. For this reason, the United States Congress has every reason to be concerned about efforts by the Palestinian Authority leadership to attain recognition of statehood while bypassing the accepted negotiation process. These efforts run counter to the Palestinians' own internationally witnessed commitments at the 1991 Madrid Conference and under the 1993 Oslo Agreement and the 2003 Roadmap. That is but one reason I'm deeply disappointed by the Palestinian leadership's recent push to seek recognition of an independent state at the United Nations. Indeed, even some Palestinian officials have acknowledged that such UN recognition of statehood gives the Palestinians nothing but an empty symbolic victory. One thing is clear. There will be no recognition of Palestinian statehood by the Security Council, where I feel confident the United Nations would use its veto, just as it has in the past, to prevent passage of an unbalanced anti-Israel anti resolution. And what exactly would UN General Assembly recognition of a Palestinian state do for the Palestinians? Absolutely nothing. It would not solve the Palestinians' need for recognized borders, nor would it solve sensitive issues like the status of Jerusalem, water rights, or Palestinian refugees. It would not enhance the prospect for successful negotiations. In fact, it would be seen by Israel and many others as an act of bad faith creating yet another obstacle to successful talks. As President Obama said in May, quote, 
For the Palestinians, efforts to delegitimize Israel will end in failure. Symbolic actions to isolate Israel at the United Nations in September won't create an independent state. A glance at recent history shows that he's right. In 1988, Yasser Arafat declared a state and garnered recognition for more than 100 nations. Now, 23 years later, there is still no Palestinian state. The Palestinian people don't want a bunch of declarations of statehood. They want a state, and they should have one through the only means possible for attaining one, negotiations with Israel. I believe that the Palestinian Authority, President Abbas, Prime Minister Fayyad, are committed to a peaceful resolution of their conflict with Israel. So I hope they will return to the negotiating table and abandon their flawed UN strategy. The Congress has been very generous in its support of the Palestinian Authority's worthy efforts to build institutions and the economy on the West Bank. In fact, I believe we are the most generous nation in the world in that regard. So I think our Palestinian friends should understand if they persist in pursuing a unilateralist path, inevitably and however regrettably, there will be consequences for U.S.-Palestinian relationships. Madam Speaker, I encourage all of my colleagues to support this important pro-negotiations, pro-peace resolution, and I reserve the balance of my time. The gentleman reserves the balance of his time. The gentlelady from Florida. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'm so pleased to yield one minute to our esteemed majority leader and uh, co-author of this resolution, the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Cantor. The gentleman from Virginia is recognized. I thank, thank the uh, gentlelady, the chairman of the Foreign Affairs Committee. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And I thank the leadership of the gentleman from California as well in support of this resolution. Madam Speaker. We call today on Hamas and the Palestinian Authority to renounce the past they have set in planning to announce statehood in the upcoming United Nations session. By threatening to sidestep the principles of the Oslo Accords, the Palestinian Authority is beginning to dismantle the framework of future peace process agreements. We have seen the death and destruction that Hamas perpetrated against both Israeli civilians and the Palestinian people in the Gaza Strip. Yet Hamas refuses to accept responsibility for its actions or rein in terrorists called to strike at the heart of the Israeli people. Today, we ask and call upon the Palestinian Authority to return to the negotiating table and join the Israelis in direct discussions to end this conflict. Furthermore, we call on the leadership of the Palestinian Authority to renounce the violence Hamas condones and teaches to its followers. This resolution, Madam Speaker, directs the Palestinian Authority to be responsible actors on the world stage and to return to negotiations. For far too long, the Palestinian Authority has not acted on behalf of its people. Corruption has caused many to discredit its legitimacy. The people of the region deserve an honest broker that accepts and respects the state of Israel. Israel has stood by America in its fight against extremist ideology. Madam Speaker, we stand by Israel as our most valued ally in a region in need of more who respect freedom of speech and the free assembly of people a region that, frankly, must follow the example set by Israel in its work and promotion of human progress. It is time for the Palestinian Authority to accept a peaceful solution to this conflict and teach their children that violence is never the answer to their problems. The Palestinian Authority must understand that peace is only achievable when they are willing to recognize the legitimacy of Israel to exist as a Jewish state. And they must understand that the solution to this conflict will only come through direct negotiations with the Israelis and not by circumventing the peace process through international parliamentary gimmickry. And with that, I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman from California. Yes, uh, Madam Speaker, I'm pleased to yield two minutes to uh, uh, the minority whip, Mr. Hoyer. I thank the gentleman the, uh, is recognized for two minutes. I thank uh, uh, Mr. Berman for yielding. I thank Ms. Rosleitman for uh, bringing this 
resolution to the floor, and I am pleased to, to join my colleague and friend, Mr. Cantor, in strong support of this resolution. I believe there is only one lasting solution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, a future of two states for two peoples living in security and peace with one another. Such a solution is in the best interest of regional peace and in the best interest of both parties. That is why I strongly believe that entering the long-term viability, ensuring the long-term viability of the Jewish Democratic State of Israel also requires supporting a homeland for the Palestinian people. History teaches us that in conflicts such as this one, peace must be negotiated. It cannot and will not be imposed from outside or else it will rest on an unstable and temporary foundation. That is why I strongly oppose Palestinian efforts to impose a solution to the conflict at the United Nations, as well as Palestinian efforts to unilaterally declare statehood. I'm concerned that a unilateral declaration will only encourage both sides to dig in and put a lasting negotiation peace further at risk. As President Obama said, and as Mr. Berman uh, has quoted, uh, but I want to quote a little more of the uh, President's remarks, but I will repeat some of what Mr. Berman said because I think they're relevant. Uh, and quote, President of the United States, for the Palestinians, efforts to delegitimize de Israel will end in failure. Symbolic actions to isolate Israel at the United Nations in September won't create an independent state. Palestinian leaders will not achieve peace or prosperity if Hamas insists on a path of terror and rejection. And Palestinians will never realize their independence by denying the right of Israel to exist. One, one additional minute. Show a minute. John, I believe recognized. the President is absolutely correct. By passing this resolution, the House will make it clear that it agrees that a real peace can only come through negotiations between the two sides. That peace will only last if both sides buy into it. We all know that those negotiations have been, are now relatively non-existent, and they will be difficult even having been entered into. They will be painful. They will require courage and sacrifice on both sides. But the hard way is also the right way. And if there is to be any hope of peace, as surely all of us pray there is, both sides must return to the table without preconditions. I urge my colleagues to support this resolution, and I will continue to urge America's allies to stand against quick, unilateral, and ultimately unstable solutions to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. I thank the gentleman and the chair for bringing this resolution to the floor and yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman yields back. The gentlelady from Florida. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'm so honored to yield uh, two and a half minutes to the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Shabbat, who is also the chairman of the Foreign Affairs Subcommittee on Middle East and South Asia. Gentleman from Ohio is recognized for two and a half minutes. I thank the distinguished uh, chair for yielding. Uh, Israel has no greater friend than uh, Ileana Ross Leitman from Florida. Uh, despite some progress that's been made toward ensuring Israel's continued security, critical challenges still exist. Rejectionist elements within the Palestinian leadership still refuse to sit and negotiate in good faith, even as Israel repeatedly expresses its commitment to the establishment of a Palestinian state. These elements spurn Israel overtures and uh, seek to establish a Palestinian state unilaterally through a vote of the UN General Assembly. Although a short-term security may be achievable unilaterally, peace is not. Palestinian rejectionism, whether by Hamas or Fatah, must be abandoned. U.S. taxpayer money should, under no circumstances, go to the Palestinian government whose members do not all abide by the three quartet principles, recognizing the state of Israel's right to exist, renouncing terrorism, and abiding by previous agreements. 
And just as the U.S. should not support a Palestinian government whose very composition is anathema to peace, so too should it not support an institution that offers an easy alternative to genuine peace through negotiations. That is why I recently introduced a resolution calling on the administration to cut all funding to the U.N. General Assembly should it vote to recognize a Palestinian state in direct defiance of the U.N. Security Council and the UN Charter. True Israeli-Palestinian peace will only be made between two peoples, Israelis and Palestinians, and not the 191 other members of the General Assembly. Israel, like the United States, welcomes those who would make peace, even as it fights those who would make war. Time and again, Israel has demonstrated its commitment to a Palestinian state living as its neighbor in peace and security. But there are no shortcuts on the path to this outcome, and there is no getting around the hard concessions that will have to be made. The U.S. must now stand with Israel and against those who would obstruct rather than advance the cause of peace. I urge the adoption of this resolution, and I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back the balance of his time. The gentleman from California. The gentleman from California. I'm very pleased to yield uh, one and a half minutes to the gentleman from New York, Mr. Nadler. Gentleman from New York is recognized for one and a half minutes. Uh, th I thank the gentleman for yielding. Madam Speaker, I rise in support of this resolution, which reaffirms support for a solution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict reached through negotiations between the Palestinians and the Israelis, and our opposition to any unilateral declaration of a Palestinian statehood or recognition of such a declaration by the United Nations. How can a dispute between two peoples ever be resolved by the unilateral decision of one? The path to peace has been clear for many years and provided for by Security Council resolutions and by the 1993 Oslo Accords signed by the Israelis and the Palestinians. All these agreements provide for settlement negotiated between the parties, a settlement that will result in two states, a Jewish state of Israel and a state of Palestine. Unilateral declaration of a Palestinian state is a way of avoiding negotiations on the tough issues, final borders, secure borders, Jerusalem, and the status of the Palestinian refugees of 1948 and their descendants. It is an attempt by the Palestinians to delegitimize Israel, to impose indefensible borders unilaterally, and to get their state while retaining the ability to keep fighting Israel, and to use the refugees' alleged right of return to undermine the survival of Israel as a Jewish state. The Palestinian Authority should instead explain to its people that a Palestinian state can be achieved only by conceding the right of a Jewish state to live in peace and security next door. And for that to happen, there must be a negotiated agreement between recognizing two states for two peoples. Evading a negotiated agreement is a formula for future war. I urge all members to support this resolution. I yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman yields back. John Lady from Florida. Madam Speaker, I'm pleased to yield two minutes to the gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Smith, who is also the chairman of the Foreign Affairs Subcommittee on Africa, Global Health, and Human Rights. Gentleman from New Jersey is recognized for I two thank minutes. Thank my good friend for yielding. Madam Speaker, I rise today in strong support of HRES 268 and deeply appreciate Majority Leader Cantor, uh, Steny Hoyer, obviously the chairwoman, Ileana Ross Layton, and Mr. Berman, the ranking member, uh, for authoring this resolution reaffirming the U.S. commitment to a negotiated settlement of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict through direct Israeli-Palestinian negotiations. H.R.E.S. 268 speaks in very clear, unambiguous language about what this means. It means settlement through direct Israeli-Palestinian negotiations rather than through highly misguided counterproductive unilateral Palestinian declaration of statehood, or by Palestinians seeking recognition from other states or through the United Nations, sadly the latter, a haven of anti-Israel and even sometimes anti-Semitic activity. Direct Israeli-Palestinian negotiations have been a keystone of U.S. and Israeli policy towards the region for decades, and even PLO Chair Yasser Arafat pledged to accept this way back in 1993. Unfortunately, Hamas, in its 2011 unity agreement with Fatah, did not accept this commitment, nor did it renounce violence. Madam Speaker, HRES 268 also outlines what a negotiated settlement should entail, negotiations in which each accepts the other's right to exist and which are aimed at a two-state solution. Again, these have been key points of U.S. and Israeli policy, but Hamas 
a State Department foreign terrorist organization has rejected them. The fact is, Madam Speaker, the U.S. law precludes foreign assistance to a PA which shares power with Hamas unless the PA publicly accepts Israel's right to exist and adheres to all prior agreements between Israel and the PLO. The U.S. government has been extremely generous to the PA, providing over $550 million annually. So the resolution wisely affirms, reaffirms this law. I ask for another 30 seconds. The gentleman is granted an additional 30 seconds. Thank you very much. Mr. Recognized. So the resolution wisely reaffirms this law and urges the administration to consider suspending assistance to the BA, PA pending a review of the unity agreement between Fatah and Hamas. It is our policy and it is Israel's policy, Madam Speaker, to promote a realistic, sustainable peace process, one that entails negotiations between two parties to the conflict represented by groups that seek a two-state solution and renounce violence. Hamas has shown none of that. Read the back. Gentleman yields back. Gentleman from California. I'm pleased, to, Madam Speaker, I'm very pleased to yield one minute to the gentlelady from Florida, Florida, Ms. Wasserman Schultz. Gentlelady from Florida is recognized for one minute. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I rise today in support of HRES 268. This important resolution reaffirms our nation's unwavering commitment to a negotiated settlement of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, which can only be achieved through direct Israeli-Palestinian peace talks. Since 1948, when the United States became the first country to recognize the Jewish state of Israel, we have always stood by her side as a strong ally and friend. This resolution is no exception. As each day brings a new set of complex changes to the Middle East, it is more vital than ever that we protect and strengthen that friendship. From insisting that Hamas reject terrorism and accept Israel's right to exist, to supporting the Obama administration's opposition to the unilateral declaration of a Palestinian state, HRES 268 reaffirms the sense of the Congress and the Obama administration that we must continue to stand strong with our democratic ally against hostile enemies and attempts at delegitimization. In doing so, we continue to demonstrate our stalwart support that we have provided as a country for more than six decades. Thank you, and I yield back the balance of my time. Florida. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, it is indeed an honor to yield one minute to the gentleman from Florida, my colleague, Colonel West, an American hero. Thanks so from much. Florida uh, is recognized for one minute. Thanks so much to the chairman and also uh, Madam Speaker. I stand today in uh, support of Resolution 268, which does reaffirm the strong support of this body politic to a negotiated solution for Israel and Palestine. The important thing that we have to see happen, though, is to urge the leaders, the Palestinian leaders, to first and foremost ensure that any Palestinian government will seek peace with Israel. As we sat here and we listened to Prime Minister Netanyahu say, there will not be peace until we have a dedicated peace partner. The second thing, we must make sure that the leaders of the Palestinian people cease all efforts at circumventing the negotiation process, including through a unilateral declaration of statehood or by seeking recognition of a Palestinian state from other nations or the United Nations. But third and probably most important, that the Palestinian leaders must take appropriate measures to counter the incitement to violence and fulfill all prior Palestinian commitments, including dismantling the terrorist infrastructure that is embodied with Hamas. Israel is a bright and shiny beacon, which is in a sea of despots, dictators, theocrats, and autocrats. The Palestinian leaders can choose to be a part of this light. Thank you, and I yield back. Gentlemen's time has expired. Gentleman from California. Mr. Madam Speaker, I'm pleased to yield one minute to a member of the House Foreign Affairs Committee, the gentleman from Connecticut, uh, Mr. Murphy. Gentleman from Connecticut is recognized for one minute. I thank the ranking member. I rise today in support of House Resolution 268 that affirms the United States' support for a negotiated solution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Setting preconditions on negotiations is just an excuse to maintain the status quo. If President Abbas is serious about peace, then he should focus all of his energies and all of the energies of his people on negotiations with Israel. An agreement won't be easy, but the outlines of an agreement are well known. All that is really necessary now is leadership from both sides. So this resolution sets firmly U.S. policy. We are a rock-solid friend of Israel. 
and anyone else who seeks peace with them. But this also means that we stand against those who seek to circumvent the peace process by running to the UN General Assembly for a declaration that may score political points but is going to set back the peace process for years. Now more than ever, uh, Madam Speaker, with turmoil on every border of Israel, we need to stand with them as an ally. We Israel wants peace. Peace can only happen with negotiations. All we are missing is a true Palestinian partner. I yield back. Inspire the gentlelady from Florida. Thank you. I'd like to yield uh, two minutes to another Florida colleague, uh, Ms. Adams, uh, a veteran of the U.S. Air Force. Gentlelady from Florida is recognized for two minutes. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you. Madam Speaker, I rise today in support of HRES 268, which would reaffirm America's commitment to a negotiated solution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict resulting in two states, a democratic Jewish state of Israel and a democratic Palestinian state living in peace and mutual recognition. For six days, decades throughout 12 American presidents and 12 Israeli prime ministers, Israel has stood as a beacon of democracy in an unstable region and has remained a loyal and committed friend to the United States. As Americans, we must continue to honor the promise of democracy and liberty around the world. We owe no less than that to our closest friend in the Middle East. This is why I will continue to stand with Israel to honor our friendship and to continue my commitment to encouraging a negotiated peace that both Israelis and the Palestinians have agreed to, not one that is imposed upon them. The United States should not and cannot dictate how peace can be reached with the Palestinians, especially when they are willing to allow Hamas, a terrorist organization, to participate in any of their elections. This is why I strongly disagree with the President's strategy to force Israel into a peace they have not negotiated. Again, I want to rise in support of HRS 268. I believe that an only peace will be a negotiated peace between Israel and the Palestinians without any influence of terrorists. I yield back. The gentlelady yields back. The gentleman from California. I'm very pleased to yield uh, uh, one minute to my friend and partner in so many of these efforts, the gentlelady from New York, the ranking member of the House uh, Foreign Operations Subcommittee of Appropriations, Ms. Lowy. The gentlelady is recognized for one minute. Mr. Speaker, I rise in strong support of the resolution, and I thank the ranking member for your leadership. Uh, and the chair. <laughs> Last week I traveled to Israel where I saw the determination, ingenuity, and resourcefulness of that young nation. In a volatile region, Israel is a strong democracy. Despite many setbacks, the country still longs for peace. Yet unilateral actions by the Palestinian Authority diminish prospects for negotiations and threaten progress. We must do everything within our power to stand by our ally Israel to persuade the Palestinians Palestinians to abandon their efforts in the UN, break with the terrorist group Hamas, and return to the negotiating table with Israel without preconditions. This resolution is a strong statement in support of peace. I urge my colleagues to vote yes. The gentlelady yields back. The gentlelady from Florida. Thank you so much, Madam Speaker. I'm pleased to yield uh, one minute to the gentleman from Arizona, Mr. Gosar. Gentleman from Arizona, recognized for one Madam minute. Madam Speaker, may I ask unanimous consent to revise and extend my remarks? Gentleman, without objection, the gentleman is recognized. I rise today in strong support for House Resolution 268. This resolution affirms congressional support for direct negotiations between Israeli and Palestinian leaders in an effort to achieve peace in this over six decades long struggle. While the Pal Palestinian pursuit of a state is understandable, the attempt to bypass the peace process by going first to the United Nations is inappropriate. It is a disgrace and an offense to the UN Charter and to all acceptable norms of international law to create or recognize a state that itself will not first forsake terrorism, violence, ethnic hatred, and genocide. If a vote for the Palestinian statehood comes to the UN Security Council, the U.S. must veto and do so until a peace agreement is achieved and maintained between the Israelis and the Palestinians. Now is not the time for either party to remove themselves from the negotiating table. Peace will not be attained with only one side seeking it. I urge my colleagues to reassert American commitment to direct negotiations by supporting H.R. 268. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman from California. Yes, Madam Speaker. Uh, Madam Speaker, could I get uh, the time remaining on each side? The gentleman from California has nine minutes remaining, and the gentlelady from Florida has 
Three and a half minutes remaining. Gentleman from California. Yes, uh, Madam Speaker, I'm pleased to yield a minute and a half to the gentleman from Florida, a member of the House Foreign Affairs Committee, Mr. Deutsch. Gentleman from Florida is recognized for one and a half minutes. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker, and uh, I thank the ranking member from California. I thank the chair of the committee, and I rise to support House Resolution 268, reaffirming our nation's unyielding support for our great ally Israel. Madam Speaker, the lack of progress in the peace process thus far stems from the Palestinians' refusal to negotiate despite historic Israeli concessions. They could choose dialogue. They could choose peace. Instead, they have chosen violence and hatred by partnering with Hamas. Israel cannot be expected to negotiate with an organization that refuses to accept the internationally recognized quartet principles, continues to murder innocent Israelis, and refuses, refuses to free Israeli soldier Gilad Shalit. This resolution comes to us as the PA pursues plans to avoid direct negotiations altogether and unilaterally declare statehood at the United Nations. Madam Speaker, just weeks ago, here in this chamber, Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu reminded us what we clearly already know, that peace cannot be imposed, peace must be negotiated. By passing this resolution, Congress will uphold this principle, will reaffirm our commitment to Israel's security, and will express our unyielding support for the Israeli people in their quest for a true and lasting peace. I urge a yes vote on this resolution, and I yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman yields back. The gentlelady from Florida. Madam, uh, Madam Speaker, we will continue to reserve the balance of our time. We only have one speaker who will uh, close the debate. The gentlelady reserves her time. The gentleman from California. Yes, uh, Madam Speaker, I'm very pleased uh, to yield one minute to a distinguished member of our committee, the ranking member of the Western Hemisphere Subcommittee, the gentleman from New York, Mr. Engel. The gentleman from New York is recognized for one minute. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I rise in uh, strong uh, support of the resolution. Uh, I come from the premise that if you want to uh, work out a disagreement, you sit face to face at the negotiating table and negotiate. That's what happened in Ireland, and it should happen in the Middle East. But the Palestinians are playing the acute little games. They want to establish a lot of preconditions. They want to make excuses not to sit and talk with Israel, and they think they can impose this at the UN uh, without imposed statehood, without face-to-face -face negotiations. So I say no to excuses, no to 1967 lines, no to all kinds of preconditions before Palestinians will even sit down and talk. Uh, the only way, if the Palestinians are true, truly want peace, they have a willing partner in Israel. As Prime Minister Netanyahu said, uh, there is no Palestinian state, not because we don't support one, it's because the Palestinians won't recognize the Jewish state. So I believe in two states, side by side, a Jewish state of Israel and an Arab-Palestinian state. And again, that can only happen with face-to-face -face negotiations, no preconditions. Let the parties sit down and talk. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I yield back. The gentlelady from Florida continues to reserve. The gentleman from California. Yes, Madam Speaker, I am... I am pleased to yield a minute and a half to the gentleman from Texas, uh, former member of the Foreign Affairs Committee, uh, Mr. Green. The gentleman from Texas is recognized for one and a half minutes. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I thank my colleague as ranking member on the Foreign Affairs Committee for allowing me to speak. I rise in strong support of H.R. 268, a resolution reaffirming our nation's commitment to negotiated settlement of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. As co-chair of the Democratic Israel Working Group, I'm, I'd like to thank my colleagues, both Rep, uh, Republican leader Eric Kanner and our Democratic whip, Cindy Hoyer, for bringing this important bipartisan resolution to the floor. I've been to Israel and the West Bank on numerous occasions, personally vouched for the desire of the people of Israel and the Palestinian territories to come to a peaceful settlement that will end decades of discord and violence. As negotiate two-state settlement between Israelis and Palestinians is a keystone in the peace process. It's the official 
official policy of our government, the Israeli governments, and until recently, the Palestinian Authority. Only through direct negotiations can difficult compromises be reached on core issues like borders, water, refugees, the state of uh, status of Jerusalem, and security. Attempts to bypass direct negotiations and seek a recognition of unilaterally declared Palestinian state by the UN General Assembly will not help the Palestinian people. Instead, such a declaration will undermine the peace process and endanger the security and well-being of the very people it claims to support. A unilaterally declared Palestinian state will be, lead to greater height and tensions, turn the region into a powder keg, and invite terrorist groups as Hamas and Hezbollah to take advantage. I urge my colleagues to support this resolution, and I thank again the Speaker for allowing me to speak. I yield back my time. The gentleman yields back. The gentlelady from Florida continues to reserve. The gentleman from California. Yes, Madam Speaker, I'm pleased to yield a minute and a half to a member of the committee, uh, uh, the ranking member of the Oversight uh, uh, Committee, the gentleman uh, from Missouri, Mr. Carnahan. Minute and a half. Gentleman from Missouri is recognized for one and a half minutes. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I rise to support the resolution 